So our next speaker is um, Gordon Ref Shorgi. Um, Gordon is a research scientist with the New South Wales DPI. He's a ruminant reproduction researcher. Studies have been wide, but his studies have been wide, covering fields of genetics, meat science, nutrition, heat stress, wool production. And, uh, he recently completed a study for MLA on meat goat reproduction. And his current studies include managing triplet ewes, mineral balance in sheep, grazing perennial wheat, improving the adoption of pregnancy scanning, uh, assessing climate variability or vulnerability of sheep and cattle, refining sheep body condition score targets. He also invented a sheep body condition scoring device, which is, in, is being further developed with an international company called Datamars. He's also the Institute Director at the Cowra Agricultural Research and Advisory Station, which he wears. So Gordon's going to talk, speak about maintaining mineral balance in sheep on grazing cereals. That okay? Can you turn that light down? Is that possible? Okay, right. I'm just going to look even bolder than I am. Sorry about that very long introduction. I should have cut that down. Jeff, it's a pass. Well done. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. How are you going? Uh, I'd like to start by thanking LLS for inviting me to speak, and I'd like to thank you, of course, for turning up. Uh, and I think that's a terrific logo for LLS. It's the first time I've seen it. Of course, I hear a collective sigh of relief. Finally, in a pastures update, we get somebody to talk about livestock. That's excellent. Uh, unfortunately, I've only got half an hour. I could talk for hours and hours on these topics. So, <clears throat> at a pastures update, I'm talking about sheep on grazing cereals, which is just a little bit off the line, but doesn't really matter. You can roll with it. Principles are reasonably there. Uh, comes out of an MDC, so an MLA DPI funded project that is led by Richard Hayes, uh, principal investigator. So grazing cereals, you all, you all know about the, uh, the rapid adoption of grazing cereals, and that's because they fit the system really nicely. Uh, by changing the seed, you change the time of sowing and you add a livestock component, you can drive productivity on the farm. It's a relatively easy technology to adopt because you're just changing the seed type and the time of sowing. It provides you with a forage base that's uh, highly digestible, which means it's got a lot of energy, it's got more, than, more protein than you need, and it provides an enormous amount of pasture growth rate during the season. That allows you to have a higher stocking rate, of course. There's some management implications that go around that. You can't graze it forever, although some people in the tablelands continue to do that, and they don't even bother locking it up and harvesting the grain. So you can get greater animal production. You can get growth rates of anywhere from 20 to 54 per cent increase in growth rate, sometimes zeros, sometimes zeros. Uh, you'll get minimal grain penalties if you lock it up at the right time, which is uh, jointing, early boot, growth stage Zadox Z31. Uh, and of course, if you've got the balance right between the amount of grazing cereals in your farm system uh, without having too many, you can provide plenty of rest for your pastures during winter, which supports the whole farm system and the greater stocking rates. And what that means is when you've got high land prices and a lot of interest in sheep production and a forage base that fills that winter feed gap, you've got a nice fit, right? So there's a lot of interest in having lambing ewes because there's not so many dry sheep running in the system. So figuring out how to get those ewes onto the grazing cereal crop is important, and particularly with the cereals, because we've got some problems with and manage some risks. So while it's a little bit about lambing ewes, uh, the rest of this talk is going to talk about lambs. And that's principally because they are a lower risk class for us. So the problem, of course, with grazing cereals, in particular wheat, it's got a gene in it, the KNA gene, which, in, which helps the plant manage sodium in the soils and it doesn't take up sodium in its root system. So it's deficient and some, some varieties and some plants are extremely deficient in sodium. But it also has uh, less calcium and less magnesium, sometimes enough, sometimes deficient, around about what we're describing as marginal. And that's a problem because when we also have excessive potassium and deficient sodium, there's a problem in the absorption of calcium and magnesium in the gut. So in particular, we're talking about uh, 
active absorption of magnesium and calcium in the rumen. Now, now magnesium is through the digestive tract. Calcium, it seems like it's mostly really limited to an impairment in the rumen. And what it talks about, what we're really looking at here is this epithelial iron pump. So in one of the cell layers in the rumen, you've got your villi and right down the bottom layers there, you've got uh, some cells there that contain a potassium sodium iron pump. And that turns over according to the concentration of sodium in the blood of the animal. And it's looking for sodium in the rumen fluid. When, it's picked that, when it picks that up, it turns over, it exchanges potassium and turns over a, a, a balance system. And as it does that, it brings in calcium and magnesium. So when we have a forage base that's absent largely in sodium, that pump doesn't turn over, so you don't get a lot of absorption of calcium and magnesium. And that's the basic story. The health risks uh, are, are broad, but principally grass tetany, really more of an issue for cattle than it is for sheep, but also milk fever. And you can get bone disorders. Rickets and osteoporosis can develop in animals that are long fed on these uh, cereal crops particularly without mineral supplementation. The highest risk class is the twin-bearing ewe, but it's a risk class is also an animal that's uh, heavy in weight or growing fast. The effect on magnesium, this is a really good graphic. So as we have potassium concentration increasing in the dry matter in the diet, as it increases on this horizontal, uh, the absorption of magnesium on the vertical starts to decline, and the rate is around about 1% increase in potassium is a 10% decrease in the absorption of magnesium. It's a pretty linear relationship, and you could technically change K in here for the ratio of K to Na, potassium to sodium. That's the relationship. So as potassium increases in the diet, we get a, a reduction in the absorption of magnesium in the rumen. This is a little bit of a busy graph, uh, but it talks about some relationships with soil potassium and the content of these minerals in the forage. It comes from some field work we did a couple of years ago. It's about 18 or so farms in this graphic. So firstly, we've got uh, forage minerals here and along here, and we have soil minerals down here and of course over here, and these are the correlations. Anything that's in bold is statistically significant in the correlation. First thing to note is that as we have an increase in the forage potassium, we get a decrease in forage sodium. Increase in forage calcium a decrease in forage magnesium and in forage sodium. So when we're increasing potassium in the soil, we're getting better plant growth rate, that's clear, but we're getting some effects in the plant as well. So if we've got a wheat plant that doesn't want to pick up sodium in the first place and is already fairly marginal for calcium and magnesium, and then we put it into a soil base that has a higher potassium, then that enhances that negative and unfavorable relationship. And just to point out, there's also a relationship in the soil exchangeable magnesium is with soil uh, potassium, and that doesn't necessarily translate, of course, into what happens in the forage. So it's the interaction between the plant and the soil and the plant and the animal that's particularly interesting here. So the, the take-home message is to provide lime, cause mag and salt. And everybody knew that when they walked in the room here, or well, they should have done. It's been the message for more than 10 years. The next question is how much? Uh, and what I'd advocate is an ad libitum, so that's just make it freely available and don't let it limit. Uh, and you would provide a ratio of two to two to one, which is by volume. So if you've ever mixed up lime into a bucket and cause mag into a bucket and then salt into a bucket, by about weight, it'll be two buckets of lime to one bucket of salt, and the same for cause mag. So by volume, the ratio is two to two to one. By weight, if you just do it in kilos, one to one to one. That'll provide you with about enough for all of the variation we can expect in your soil mineral status, particularly for potassium and the interactions with your plant varieties. So how much per head? The calculations show that about five grams intake per day can solve a lot of the problems on average, depends on how extreme your soils are. 
We do our research by doubling that, just in case you have animals that are variable in their intake and just to be sure that they're eating enough and it doesn't run out. And they're confidently eating 30 grams a day of these products. So that's around about where the money is. Uh, and you can get a growth rate by providing these mineral supplements anywhere in the literature from around zero to 60%. And in your budget, I would put 20% in. You should expect 20% improvement in growth rate just by providing cause mag and salt. You add the calcium because animals still have problems with their bone health. So we're hypothesizing that we don't necessarily have to provide minerals, make them freely available all the time, have to manage the problems with rainfall uh, and having variable intake between animals, which we at the moment can't quantify. Um, some, a little bit of work I've done with some animals suggests maybe even 20 or 25 per cent of the sheep aren't eating minerals, uh, but that's difficult to prove. Um, so if we, instead of having the loose lick minerals available, which you have to pay for anywhere between 600 and maybe $1,000 a tonne, uh, and you've got to get them out there, you've got to keep them dry, got to keep the intake up, we hypothesise that you could have a plant that does the, the same thing. So with the work we're doing with Richard and Perennial Wheat, which is sort of a, a forage and a farming system fit for the future, we've thought about a biculture, adding another plant in there that has some additional benefits. So we're thinking about legumes, of course, and we're looking for legumes that are higher in calcium, magnesium and sodium, because right, that makes sense. That's what we're trying to provide in supplements. Theoretically, better uh, alternates to cost of production and improved animal performance. Now, we chose lucerne in the, in the study I'm going to talk about now uh, because it grows freely and tall and we can harvest it with a, a sickle bar mower, which makes it easier for our feeding experiments. Um, it sits out out of the ground. If we wanted to use clover, uh, we would roll the dice on the seasonal break and, and maybe the clover is too short to the ground. So we've chosen lucerne. It has better magnesium, better calcium and better sodium than does wheat, although lucerne, as you know, So we hypothesise that we would improve the metabolic status of lambs that were fed uh, a, a biculture diet that contained lucerne compared to animals that were fed a straight diet of either wheat or perennial wheat. Our study was uh, a four by four in its design. So the perennial wheat actual plants are here growing on the left. We had a number of bays like this and the wedge tail wheat is here as a standard, pretty common uh, forage. maybe getting a bit outdated, but it's a reference value for everybody. And the lucerne was grown on the bay alongside. We have three sets of bays like this. So the diets were either perennial wheat on its own, or we took some lucerne out of here and added it with the perennial wheat. So plus or minus lucerne. We used a sickle bar mower and the forage was cut daily. Uh, we tried to get the cutting height right. So we were as best we could mimicking what the sheep would eat, but that's very difficult to do, so there's still some variation in stem length, but we tried to keep it off the ground to avoid picking up a lot of litter. Around about, uh, this is about 600 grams dry matter. That's uh, all the grass that would fit in a tub. The animals were fed a, a tub uh, in the morning and a tub in the afternoon, and up to three tubs during the day, and the tub was 52 litres, and we expected these lambs to eat that, which was at the start of the experiment, 900 grams dry matter, and by the end of the experiment, 1.4 kilos of dry matter intake. So we absolutely jammed it in them as best as we could. It's a large amount of dry matter when you allow for the water content and feed. So it's a good graphic. Lambs were fed individually, which allowed us to measure feed intake, of course, and a look at their growth rate. So we measured their refusals on a daily basis. Uh, and it also gave us a sense for the palatability, whether the sheep wanted to really eat perennial wheat or not, because it's the first time in the world perennial wheat's been fed to livestock as a part of this study. And then, of course, we could look at the mineral balance effects. To get to mineral balance, we're looking at the concentrations of these minerals, not only in the blood, which we extract out of the plasma, but also in the urine. So uh, that's a great job. So the results. <clears throat> Firstly, uh, the, the result summary in these slides, the way I present this is the result summary is here, uh, and then I'll go through the details fairly carefully. We had large dietary differences because of the forage types that we were offering these animals, and they were statistically significant. 
Uh, I'll work slowly through this, so if you're at the very back of the room, I apologise. You'll just have to squint a little harder, but I'll go fairly slowly. Uh, we're starting with sodium here, uh, and what we have is an, an extremely deficient forage base. The grasses on their own are extremely deficient, uh, and adding lucerne, which is still deficient on its own, uh, still gave us a diet that was extremely deficient in sodium. So we were looking for, for lambs around about 45 to 50 kilos, growing between 150 to 250 grams a day. They needed about 0.06 per cent, and we were offering them at best 0.015, so a quarter of that, and at worst a tenth of what they required. So not much sodium. Uh -oh. Okay, this is gonna get ugly in a minute, folks. Okay, so calcium. Uh, so we've got significant differences. So you can see from the, from the legend here, so we have wedge tail wheat uh, in red and plus lucerne is the dashed line and perennial wheat is in blue and plus lucerne is the dashed line. We have an enormous amount of calcium in the diet. The lambs only needed the amount on this little fine dashed line through here. A twin bearing ewe would need more than 0.4 or around about. So it was deficient for twin bearing ewes. And in this study, uh, adequate or marginal for lambs. Potassium was excessive. Uh, the literature suggests we don't really want too much more than about 0.5 per cent and the maximum tolerable level is 3 per cent and all of our diets were well and truly above that. But by adding lucerne, we reduced the average concentration that the animals were eating uh, in their diet. Oh, okay, right, slipped around, great. So uh, adequate magnesium. So we were looking for 0.09 per cent and we had everything greater than 0.11. So reasonable magnesium. And we're deficient in phosphorus, which is interesting, a little unexpected. And, we, and we, when we added lucerne, it got worse. So the picture here, the picture is you've got to see all of these things together. We've got uh, deficient sodium, adequate magnesium, heaps of calcium, still too much potassium. Uh, we won't worry about phosphorus too much at the moment. Plasma mineral content, right? So our diets offered a mineral difference, right? So they had different mineral intakes. Now plasma, which tells us what's going through the body and into the bloodstream, says that there were differences due to time, but not to the treatment. So we're deficient in sodium. So this is plasma sodium. That dotted line there is where the literature says you have a deficiency. And so by week two, these lambs have fallen below that level. So we've got a diet now, even though they're different, still deficient. With magnesium, and this is a really very interesting graphic, and these two graphics I'll come back to a bit later and show again in the presentation. And this is just so very interesting. Uh, continual decline in magnesium. So while we've still got uh, adequate magnesium in the diet, because we don't have enough sodium and we've still got too much potassium, we have impairment of absorption of magnesium in the rumen, and it's plummeting. Now in the literature, it says that around about 18, 17.7 milligrams per litre, uh, in magnesium, you'll have deficiencies in twin bearing ewes, but for lambs of this weight, it's around about seven. So we didn't have any uh, 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 clinical signs of grass tetany, hypermagnesemia. We didn't see any evidence for that, but they're on their way down. Uh, marginal phosphorus heading down as well, which is interesting, perhaps backs up what happens in the forage. Adequate calcium, that's also interesting. So it's on the way up. Um, a subclinical level is around about 90 and a clinical disease for hypercalcemia is at 70. So no particular problems there. If your eyes are good enough, you'll see some smaller lines in around here. That's the real data. And so we have some lambs down at the bottom here in, uh, in the adjustment phase onto the forage. And potassium, there's no reference values for how much potassium in blood is adequate and it's moving around, but not different between any of the treatments. So we've got a dietary difference but it's not different in the plasma. So urine, just the same as the plasma. Some differences due to time, but not to the treatment. The values here, so we're, I'm reporting the concentration of the mineral as a ratio of the amount of creatinine that's in the blood. So that gives us a reference value for what's going through the blood and out through the kidneys to the urine. Uh, and there's a couple of papers that were published through CSU, uh, Matthew Chapness, as well as Farouk. Uh, so sodium, 
extremely low, and it's 10 times lower than other published values when they talk about this ratio in sheep on cereals or lucerne. So bugger all sodium coming out of these animals. Magnesium, again, low and up to 20 times less uh, than the other published literature. Just the same as phosphorus, three to 50 times lower than other published data. Extremely low calcium, 10 times, uh, and very high uh, potassium, up to one and a half times other published findings. So in the urine, the story is the body doesn't want to let these key minerals out. It's holding on to sodium, it's holding on to magnesium, uh, and it's still holding on to calcium, even though calcium in the blood's rising. So it's intriguing. Take home messages. If you're adding lucerne to wheat or have a degraded lucerne stand that you're going to sow wheat through and just try to value add on a grazing component, uh, you still need to, uh, while you're increasing the dietary intake of these key minerals and the ratios, which I didn't talk about, we're not improving the and the forage sodium are the real threat. And so there's the graphic reminder of plasma magnesium declining throughout the study and sodium falling away. Uh, I probably should just add, uh, the reason it doesn't change in the first week or so is because the rumen is the body's store of sodium. So it's just got this big reserve and it's just slowly working through it. That little KNA pump in the epithelium is just slowly working through it. And then it becomes deficient uh, and it starts to plummet in the blood. And the, and the kidneys say, we're not letting any of this go. And that's the first response. Increased plasma calcium is really interesting uh, and it may be a little difficult to explain. If you're familiar with some of the calcium work, it's under a homeostatic control. That means it's self-regulated. There's hormones that say, uh, if I don't have enough calcium in the blood, I will go and try to improve the efficiency of absorption in the gut, or I will turn to the bones and I'll take it out of the bones. So you've got a number of hormones that are influencing this system. It's governed by the parathyroid hormone and it involves vitamin D3. That also has a, a, a that can also be influenced by the pH uh, in the animal, particularly around the uh, urine pH is a measure for that. Um, so there's some other complicating factors in here around calcium. So if we've got calcium increasing in the blood, we've got plenty in the diet, but no dietary differences in the plasma, but it's going up in the plasma, but it's not being excreted, then we can hypothesize a great deal in the urine um, or in the plasma. We can probably suspect that it's calcium coming out of the diet uh, from the lower intestine outside the rumen. So we reject our hypothesis, which is the lucerne is a, a, a solution by culture diet, um, because we still need to provide sodium and magnesium as a supplement with these animals. This is my second last slide. So wheat diets, if you're feeding your animals a wheat diet, the, tr the, the conventional advice is to provide a one to one to one by weight mineral supplement of sodium or salt, uh, lime and cause mag. And we're suggesting we're offering about 30 grams, so 10, 10 grams a head a day for each animal in sheep, uh, probably the same for cattle, it'll be the same for cattle. On, in our studies, on the soil potassium that we've got, which is a little higher, and a little higher than the average that uh, Lisa showed for her extensive surveys, uh, we would calculate that we'd need to provide about 40 grams a head a day. So the one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one will still do the job, a little more salt, and about the same amount of cause mag and lime will do the job. I've come in with about eight minutes up my sleeve, so I'm just going to slowly work through this list of acknowledgements. That's uh, a joke. We can. Um, so there's a lot of people there, but principally MDC funded work through New South Wales DPI, uh, and of course research can't happen without a large team of people. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you want them now or in the panel. In the panel. In the panel. Yeah. Thanks very much, folks. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gordon. Very topical given the rise in uh, grazing wheats over the last few years um, and something that a lot of growers have battled with or um, been working through over the last at least probably five, maybe even ten years.